I speak to you in the name of the triune God. Amen. What do you hear in these words of scripture? Let us break open the word together. Do you believe in miracles? Perhaps a better question is not, do I believe in miracles, but am I acting like I believe in miracles? Think about that for a bit, we'll come back to it. In our reading from 2 Kings, we have this encounter. Elisha says to the man bringing food from the first fruits, give it, the 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain, give it to the people and let them eat. The response is, how can I set this before a hundred people? Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. Hearing this story, we probably fast forwarded in our minds to today's gospel story in John of, of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. That's 5,000 men and women and children too. It shows that some things do not change. There is suffering and need in the world and God's blessings are more abundant than we often realize. This sense of abundance is shown in Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. In chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, which is the epistle reading appointed to go with the two other readings that we have, we hear that God's will is to include the Gentiles in salvation. All followers of Jesus Christ are part of God's own family. There is no insider versus outsider, no us and them. Paul then prays for the church in Ephesus. He knows that the church must rely on God, not itself. God is at work in the church. God is at work in this congregation. God's holy power is present even in our weak attempts to live faithfully, lovingly, and courageously in the face of our troubles. Our daring prayers to be strengthened in faith and to comprehend God's grace are not asking too much. In fact, God is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. Why do we have two separate stories in our passage from John and two miracle stories to boot? I've been puzzling about this for days. The problem with miracles is that they get us off the hook. We want to wait for God to act, to perform some kind of miracle, while we do little or nothing. But God almost always invites us to participate. Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. Go and be healed. You give them something to eat. Maybe we have these two stories so we can link the story to the feeding in the wilderness and God's revelation to Moses when he says, I am who I am. We have in John the big picnic where everyone is fed and then Jesus responding to the frightened disciples with the words, it is I, I am. The feeding of the 5,000 takes place during Passover, celebrating God's deliverance of Israel from captivity in Egypt. So we are in a way set up for that link. John's gospel is big on miracles or signs. There are six or seven depending on how one defines them. These signs are all identified as such in the text. The events in Jesus' public ministry to the Jews, defined as signs, all demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ and Son of God and that all should believe. 
So we have the feeding of manna in the wilderness and the appearance of God to lead the Israelites through the Red Sea. In the Hebrew mind, the sea is the place where demons dwell, as well as all the forces that oppose God. The disciples included many experienced fishermen. They were used to the water, the storms, and the small boat. Apparently, storms blow up all the time on these lakes. And yet this time, they are terrified. They are rescued by Jesus. God rescued Israel. Jesus is the one who now says, it is I, don't be afraid. These two stories were obviously important for the early church. The feeding narrative is the only miracle story that all four Gospels record. And accounts of Jesus walking on the sea, calming a storm, are found in all of the Gospels except Luke. Of course, the stories vary somewhat from one telling to the next, and that's why it is in Matthew's Gospel that we have Peter climbing out of the boat to go and meet Jesus. John keeps it very simple. There is overwhelming need and scarce resources. Jesus is trying to get away for a time of rest, but the crowds are following him. He sees the hundreds and thousands of people spread out on the grass and realizes they need to be fed. Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little, says Philip. Andrew asks, what are they, the five loaves and two fish that the little boy has brought forward? What are they among so many people? We live in a world where we face overwhelming needs. A quick glance at the paper or listening to the news gives evidence of that. Just today, Poverty, encampments for the homeless, forest fires, flooding, earthquakes, COVID-19, mass graves, you name it. It is easy to look at the magnitude of need and the promise of few resources. It is easy to come to a place of despair. What do you have? Whatever we have, we think is not enough. Hudson Taylor, who lived from 1832 to 1905, was a great man of faith whose missionary efforts helped open China to the gospel. He saw God do amazing things time and time again in the face of hopeless circumstances and hostilities. Reflecting on his experience, Taylor remarked, that there are three stages in any work attempted for God. Impossible, difficult, done. I looked a long time for that quote. I couldn't remember a part of it, but I found it. Impossible, difficult, done. If only I could look at my life and tasks in this way, I often get stuck on the impossible. Several years ago, I heard in a sermon that if what you are doing is not life-giving, it is probably not from God. That's a different way of looking at Hudson Taylor's impossible, difficult, done. We can't get to the done if we are not living a life set aside for God. God will give us whatever we need to do God's will. And God will do it in God's own time, in God's own way, and according to God's own will. God can work with the meager offerings of the people to do great things for the needs of the world. God can take the tiny and insignificant things that we've tucked away and kept hidden from those around us, and God can use them. 
you might have a lot and be able to give. But when you've got almost nothing to give, God can still use that. In fact, Scripture tells us that this seems to be God's favorite way to work in the world. God takes something that to us might seem broken or worthless or empty and uses it. We have Sarah in her old age giving birth to Isaac. We have Moses leading God's people out of Egypt. An argumentative Jonah swallowed by a fish a young David, defeating Goliath, and a poor carpenter and teacher who becomes the savior of the world by dying on a cross. God does not conquer the world with power and might. Jesus dies and then is resurrected. We have an empty tomb God will go to the darkest places of the world, the most empty places, the places devoid of any hope, the place of death, and God will bring about life. God takes not only our successes and gifts, but our weaknesses and our meager places and plans and uses them. Do I believe in miracles? I am okay with not having a rational explanation for the feeding of the 5,000, such as everyone has a little lunch packed away and then brings it out to share so everyone is fed, or that Jesus was walking by the water and not on the water. Do I believe in miracles? Am I acting like I do? Am I including the people who are typically excluded? Am I feeding the hungry and caring for the sick? Am I holding the hands of the homeless and offering help to the addicts? Am I working to break down religious and political barriers that marginalize ethics, ethnic, religious and sexual minorities and people with disabilities? Am I financially supporting the work and ministry of this parish of St. Mary and St. Martha with the generosity of the little boy giving all he has and not what he has left over? Am I behaving as though life is more than a meaningless, chaotic mess? that there is some order in the storm. God is asking us, what do you offer me? Maybe our response is not much or the equivalent of five loaves and two fish. And God replies, fantastic. I can work with that. Thanks be to God.